listening activities so uh, uh, over to you Amaosi for your talk thank you very much Thank you, sir, for those kind words of introduction. And I would like to thank the KSM for inviting me for this talk. Um, so to start off with my presentation, childhood and adolescent obesity is a common, complex, and a persistent chronic disease in pediatrics. It is associated with serious health and social consequences. And there's an increased risk of comor comorbidities as well as a greater risk for obesity in adulthood. And it also has a higher risk of premature death in uh, children. To look at the global impact, um, currently 14.4 million children and adolescents are affected due to obesity. And a, a study done in US have shown that uh, it has affected adolescents and children um, and it has tripled over the years from 55% in 1963 to 1965 period to 19% in 2017 to 2018. So um, looking at the situation in Sri Lanka, these are the data of, um, obtained from Global Obesity Observatory. Um, this data is actually from 2016, not the latest, but what is available at the moment. Um, the national obesity risk in Sri Lanka is 6.5 per 10, while childhood obesity risk is 5 per 11. And uh, when we look at the um, um, obesity uh, percentages, um, there is 2.7% uh, in girls, the prevalence, and 1.7% in boys. Uh, this data is from 2016, not the updated one. So how has the COVID pandemic affected um, obesity in children? Um, the COVID-19 pandemic has significantly affected the lives and routines of children and adolescents. Uh, the pandemic period was associated with a doubling in the rate of BMI increase compared with the pre-pandemic period. This was a study done in US between the uh, period of 2018 and 2020. So let's look at the latest guidelines. Um, what I will be focusing on uh, is the guidelines and recommendations given by the American Academy of Pediatrics, which is the latest available at the moment, uh, published in February 2023. And there are other guidelines which were published in 2017 um, by an endocrine society in US. Uh, and um, our local, um, local guidelines published in 2018 which is on prevention of overweight and obesity among school children in Sri Lanka, published by the Family Health Bureau. So um, let's look at some definitions. Children and adolescents above the age of two years of age, um, when do we call them overweight? It is when the BMI is 20, at the 25th percentile or above, but below uh, the 95th percentile. And when the BMI is um, above 95th percentile for the age and gender, we label them as obese. And children below the age of two years, uh, we check the weight for recumbent length. And if it is above the 97.7th percentile, they are labeled as, as obese. And um, BMI of more than 120% um, of the 95th percentile or 35 or more kilograms per square meter is considered extreme obesity. So what are the recommendations for screening? Um, body mass skin tests have been the um, recommended tool and I assume that everybody is familiar with the calculation of BMI which is weight in kilograms divided by square meters um, which is uh, the height measured by square meters. Right. So it's generally well correlated with direct measures of body fat, um, which is 
usually measured with skin pole thickness measurements, bioelectrical impedance, densitometry, and dual energy X-ray absorptometry. And it is replicable and can track weight status in children and adolescents and frequently used to follow a child or adolescent's weight trajectory over time. But there are disadvantages as well. It does not directly measure body composition and fat content and may under or over detect excess adiposity in certain racial and ethnic groups. And children and adolescents who have high fat free mass may have a high BMI and be incorrectly classified as having overweight or obesity. So these are the BMI charts that we use um, in our clinic setup. Uh, for the ages from birth to two years, we use um, weight for height charts, which is shown on the um, left of the slide. And then from ages two to five years, uh, we have a separate uh, chart. And for uh, children above the age of five years, five to 19 years, we have um, separate BMI charts for both boys and girls. And uh, you can see that any standard deviations above one uh, plus one SD and um, between one plus SD and two SD is considered overweight. And um, a BMI of more than plus two SD is considered as um, obese in both charts. So um, the current recommendations for screening, according to the American uh, Academy of Pediatrics clinical practice guidelines, is to do annual screening for excess weight using BMI beginning at the age of two years. So these are the risk factors for obesity and um, children and adolescents. So um, there are family and environmental factors, neighborhood and community factors, individual factors and policy factors. So just to look at some family and environmental factors, parenting uh, feeding style, sugar sweetened beverages, portion sizes, snacking behavior, screen time, lack of exercise, sleep duration and psychosocial stresses. And when we look at the neighborhood and community factors, school environment, lack of fresh food access, fast food uh, proximity, access to safe physical activity and environmental health. And um, the individ individual factors are genetic, prenatal and postnatal risks, endocrine disorders, children with special needs, medication use and depression, and then again the policy factors, marketing of unhealthy foods, under-resourced communities and food insecurity. So these are some of the endocrine disorders uh, which are associated with obesity. It accounts for less than 1% of all causes of pediatric obesity and some of them are uh, mentioned here. Cushing syndrome, pseudo-hyperparathyroidism type 1A, hypothyroidism, and growth hormone deficiency. And some genetic syndromes associated with obesity, um, monogenetic disorders, Prader-Willi syndrome, Alstrom syndrome, barded beetle syndrome, Albright's hereditary osteodystrophy, Cohen syndrome, and beckwith wiedemann syndrome. And there are also medications which are uh, obesogenic. Some of them are very commonly prescribed in our routine practice. Um, for example, I'm sorry about the slides, very, the font is really small. Um, so the, there are antihistamines we commonly prescribe for allergies and asthma management, which are obesogenic, and um, steroids, and some antidepressants like amitriptyline, sertraline, and antiepileptics like carbamazepine, um, valproate, antipsychotics like haloperidol, risperidone, um, and um, migraine um, medications like imipramine, um, flunorazine, and uh, mood stabilizers and psychostimulants. But then there are um, non-obesogenic alternatives for these uh, medications that we use. And I think the next time we prescribe and if we get a patient with obesity and overweight, maybe we would think again and then uh, change over to non-obesogenic medications. Right. So um, there are comorbidities um, associated with pediatric overweight and uh, obesity. These uh, most common ones are being um, type 2 diabetes mellitus, then dyslipidemia, hypertension, early subclinical atherosclerosis, cardiovascular morbidity, sleep apnea, bronchial asthma, uh, gastroesophageal reflux disease, cholelithiasis, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, hyperandrogenemia, polycystic ovary syndrome, and then renal disorders like um, proteinuria and focal segmental glomerular sclerosis, 
uh, orthopedic conditions like slip capital femur lepathesis and uh, Blount's disease. Um, then pseudotumor cerebri, which affect the CNS, and poor social, uh, psychological and emotional health, increased stress, low self-esteem, depressive symptoms, and also premature mortality in adulthood. This is the approach to the management. It is, um, I'm sorry, that's, the slide is not completely projected here. Um, so it's a multidisciplinary um, management involving the pediatrician, which is the component here, which you can't see at the moment. And then uh, nutrition physicians, endocrinologists, nurses, psychologists, exercise specialists, social workers, families, school and communities. So what are the recommendations? Um, so the first and foremost um, important um, uh, recommendation is proper communication. So we need to avoid stigmatization through correct communication. First, we must ask permission to discuss the patient's weight and BMI uh, on the first visit and when we notice them that they have a higher BMI levels. And then we should also make sure that we avoid labeling the patient and um, such as uh, using the word child with obesity instead of obese child or maybe my patient is affected by obesity and not saying that my patient is obese. And uh, we should also make sure that we use words perceived as neutral by parents and children. For example, unhealthy weight or gaining too much weight for age, height and health rather than using words like obese, morbidly obese, large, fat, chubby, and overweight. Um, then we should also take a detailed history. Uh, first look at how concerning uh, the weight, overweight, and obesity is for the family. And look at prenatal factors like maternal weight gain during pregnancy, maternal smoking, and GDM. Postnatal factors like low birth weight, less than 2,500 grams, and uh, large for uh, the um, birth weight of more than four kilograms, and then prematurity and small for gestational age. And also, um, the information should be sought regarding cessation of breastfeeding and commencing formula feeding early, and the rapid weight gain during infancy and early childhood, and also a history of early use of antibiotics, which cause alteration of gut microbiota affecting the energy balance. Um, then we should also look for features of endocrine disorders and in children with special needs. Um, we need to take a history to detect any features of autism, ADHD, myelomeningocele. So myelomeningocele, um, the association with obesity is because of the uh, reduced mobility. And autism and ADHD, there is an increased um, uh, appetite uh, and behavioral issues. So that leads to obesity. And then weight promoting appetitive traits like fast eating, eating in the absence of hunger, high enjoyment of food, low responsive to satiety and low levels of restraint eating. And then again, uh, we should ask about the medication use as I mentioned earlier. And uh, moving on, um, so we should also look for features of comorbidities, features of anxiety and depression, and ask for family history of obesity obesity-related comorbidities, and bariatric surgery. Um, and social history, uh, important facts are to find out the eating habits, food security, eating with or without a screen, family meals, harsh parenting, and then we should not forget to take a 24-hour dietary recall and ask the patient to maintain a food diary. Um, and again, uh, the, inquire about the physical activity. So in other countries, they may be using pedometers, wearable activity monitors, which may be useful to assess the level of activity. Um, this slide shows the um, important things to ask in the systemic inquiry, which we have already covered. So I will skip this slide. And then um, to assess the, how to assess the dietary intake and physical activity. So how do you assess the dietary intake? You can ask about eating outside the home, consumption of sweet drinks, portion sizes, meal habits, including uh, skipping meals, and snack habits and fruit and vegetable consumption. While um, to assess the physical activity, you can um, 
inquire about the sedentary time, especially recreational screen time, and the level of activity, whether it is moderate or vigorous. So in physical examination, um, in the general examination, um, should look for short stature, early height velocity increase, early onset peak height uh, velocity, and early weight gain before the age of five years. And uh, in the, um, also should also look for depression, anxiety, attention-seeking behavior, and in eye examination, check for papilledema, which is uh, related to uh, idiopathic intracranial hypertension. And then examination of the mouth, look for dental caries and tonsillar hypertrophy. Tonsillar hypertrophy is associated with obstructive sleep apnea. And examination of the neck, uh, look for goiters, suggestive of hypothyroidism, and then cervical dorsal hum, which is also known as buffalo hum, uh, which can indicate an endocrine disorder. Cardiovascular system, look for hypertension and tachycardia. And chest examination, gynecomastia in uh, male children. Wheezing, indicating bronchial asthma and then brace palpitations, uh, which may be related to heart failure. Examination of the abdomen, uh, look for hepatomegaly. If it is more than 2 centimeters in children or a liver span of more than 5 centimeters if they are above the age of 5 years. And then examination of the genitals. Um, commonly, you might find buried penis uh, in obese patients. And then look for pubertal status and hypogonadism to check for um, endocrine disorders and syndromes. Right. Um, so looking at the musculoskeletal system, observe the gait. If there is a limp, hip pain with external rotation, which may suggest of um, slipped capital femoral epiphysis. And then genuarum, which indicates lung disease. And then also look for black pain. In the skin, what we look for is a contosis nigricans, hirsutism, acne, striae, intertrigo, tannus, and hydradenitis suppurativa. So what are the recommendations for lab investigations? So basically, the lab investigations are performed to screen for uh, comorbidities. So children with obesity, when they are 10 years or above, the recommendation is to do a fasting lipid profile, fasting blood sugar, ALT and AST. And children between the age of 2 to 9 years, the recommendation is to do just a fasting lipid profile because the, uh, there's low risk for NAFLD and type 2 diabetes in this age group. And children with overweight, if they are 10 years and above, um, they should undergo a fasting lipid profile. And the fasting blood sugar, ALT and AST are indicated only when there are risk factors. So there are specific guidelines for evaluation of comorbidities. Um, for example, dyslipidemia, um, the prevalence of abnormal lipid levels were three times higher in children and adolescents with obesity. Uh, what you usually see is a high triglyceride level and a low HDL. And then you might also find elevated total cholesterol and elevated LDL levels. So the tests recommended are fasting lipid profile, fasting for 8 to 12 hours, and a non-fasting lipid panel for children between the age of 9 to 11 years to assist the familiar hypercholesterolemia. They use the non-HDL levels when they do a non-fasting lipid panel. So these are the cutoff uh, values for um, diagnosing dyslipidemia. So um, for to total cholesterol, anything above 200 mg per deciliter is considered high. And LDL of more than 130 mg per deciliter is also considered high. And an HDL of less than 40 milligrams per deciliter is considered a low HDL levels. And then the triglyceride levels, depending on the age group, there are cutoff values to diagnose. So looking at pre-diabetes and type 2 diabetes, it is now increasingly diagnosed in pediatric population. Uh, type 2 diabetes has been diagnosed in children younger than 10 years and some as young as 4 years of age. And children have a more rapid rate of progression of islet B cell failure and dysglycemia compared with adults when they're diagnosed. So these are the tests to diagnose type 2 diabetes, a fasting blood sugar, OGTT and HbA1c. Um, HbA1c is a good measure of chronic hypoglycemia and also for monitoring pre-diabetes patients. But there are limitations. OGTT is poor patient there has poor patient compliance due to the concentration of the uh, solution given, 
and HbA1c uh, has a sensitivity in diagnosing type 2 di uh, diabetes is lower in adult, uh, children compared to adults and um, in levels are about 0.1 to 0.2 percent higher in iron deficiency anemia as well so you get false uh, values. So what is not recommended is a fasting insulin level for diagnosing pre-diabetes and type 2 diabetes as it is um, poorly correlating with levels of insulin resistance. Um, these are the criteria for diagnosing pre-diabetes and type 2 diabetes. So a fasting plasma glucose level of more than 126 milligrams per deciliter is uh, in, uh, helpful to diagnose diabetes mellitus and a OGTT value of more than 200 milligrams per deciliter and an HbA1c of more than 6.5%. So um, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, um, there is a spectrum uh, described. It ranges from a mild steatosis to cirrhosis of the liver. So NAFL, that is non-alcoholic fatty liver, is a fatty infiltration of more than 5% of the liver with or without fibrosis. And then um, steatohepatitis is inflammation, steatosis, fibrosis, and ballooning injury to hepatocytes. So it is less common in children less than 10 years, but there's a higher risk in children between 2 to 9 years with severe obesity. So these are the uh, diagnostic, uh, diagnosing criteria, risk factors, um, and the test recommended at the moment is ALT by the 2017 Clinical Practice Guideline, which has been brought forward into the new guideline as well. Um, you can perform ASD and Gamma GT, um, and a normal level of ALT does not definitely exclude non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And test is uh, recommended to be performed every two years in high-risk groups to detect NAFLD. So another important comorbidity is hypertension. And it is the obesity is the strongest risk factor for hypertension in childhood. Prevalence is about 5 to 30 percent among children and adolescents with overweight and obesity. And in the children with obesity, hypertension is associated with vascular changes, increased left ventric ventricular mass, and carotid in in time uh, media thickness during childhood. So how do you evaluate for hypertension? You should ask in the history regarding the salt intake, sources of sodium from um, processed, frozen and fast food, level of physical activity and inactivity, sleep duration, features of um, obstructive sleep apnea and the recommendation is to evaluate blood pressure at each clinic visit beginning at the age of three years. So there are um, categories of blood pressure um, and the number of visits needed for diagnosis. So um, when the blood pressure is normal, um, that is in the age from 1 to 13 years, the blood pressure percentile is less than 90th centile. And then children above the age of 13 years, if the blood pressure is less than 120 by 80, they are considered to have a normal value. And when they have elevated uh, blood pressure values, um, it is advised to uh, clarify the rise in blood pressure in uh, uh, subsequent uh, visits. The number of visits are given here where you may need three visits um, to diagnose hypertension. But when the blood pressure is very high, that is in the age of 1 to 13 years, and they have a blood pressure percentile of more than 95th percentile plus 12 millimeters of mercury, or in children above 13 years when the blood pressure is 140 by 90, you only need two visits to confirm a diagnosis of hypertension. So looking at obstructive sleep apnea, um, ask in the history regarding snoring, daytime somnolence, nocturnal enuresis, morning headaches, and inattention. The test recommended is polysomnography, and if at least one symptom of disorders breathing is uh, present. So um, polycystic ovarian syndrome is also associated with obesity and the recommendation for diagnosis of adolescents are evidence, uh, evidence of clinical or biochemical hyperandrogenism and persistent irregular menstrual cycles that is less than 20 days or more than 45 days, two years after menarche. And there are several tests that you can perform which is given uh, below. So we should also look for features of depression. 
um, a systemic review, systematic review and meta-analysis conducted in 2019 has shown that there's um, in children 18 years and younger with obesity have a 32% increase odds of having or developing depression compared with children of healthy weight with the highest odds of being among the females with obesity. So what is the recommendation? Uh, it is to monitor for symptoms of depression in children and adolescents with obesity and to conduct annual and evaluation annual for depression for adolescents 12 years and older with a formal self-report uh, tool. So um, these are the orthopedic conditions uh, and the recommendations to detect uh, these two conditions. Uh, slipped capital femoral epiphysis is a common hip disorder be between the age of 9 to 16 years of age. And Blount disease is a growth disorder affecting the proximal medial tibial physis and epiphysis. Um, so there are recommendations on imaging. I'm sorry, this part of the slide is not uh, seen clearly here. Um, but uh, what the um, first, line first line imaging uh, recommended for slipped capital femoral epiphysis is bilateral hip, anteroposterior and lateral or frog leg radiographs, while for Blount disease, long leg uh, anteroposterior and lateral, knee anteroposterior and lateral radiographs. And you can also do an MRI if, when indicated. Idiopathic intracranial hypertension, um, you have to maintain a high index of suspicion um, with new onset or progressive headaches in the context of significant weight gain, especially for females. So in the history, ask for persistent headache, pulsatile synchronous tinnitus, and visual change, changes and losses. And in the examination, look for papilledema cranial nerve deficits, such as sixth nerve palsy. So recommendation is the moment you find these uh, symptoms and signs, you should do a neurology referral, ophthalmology referral, and an urgent neuroimaging to rule out a SOM. So let's look at the recommendations for treatment. And it should be integrated within the existing community and social systems. And intensive and long-term care strategies uh, should be implemented. And provision of ongoing and medical monitoring is important, and as well as treatment of comorbidities. And our target is to focus on increasing healthy food consumption, participating in physical activities for enjoyment and self-care reasons, and improving overall uh, self-esteem and self-concept. So these are the three areas and strategies. We should look for, um, the recommendations are to uh, implement specific health behavior and use of pharmacotherapy. And then there is also a place for pediatric metabolic and bariatric surgery. And the recommendations are that clinicians should prescribe and support lifestyle modifications. I stress on prescribe um, that rather than advice. And then we should uh, look into dietary, physical activity and behavior uh, as well. And then it should be intensive, age appropriate, culturally sensitive as well as family centered. So let's look at the diet. Uh, these are the recommendations given in the uh, latest uh, clinical practice guidelines. So it is advised to reduce the sugar sweetened beverages. So actually the consumption of sugar should be less than 25 grams of sugar, that is six teaspoons of added sugar per day, or less than eight ounces of uh, sugar sweetened beverages per week. And we should also discourage the consumption of sports drinks and energy drinks, and then eliminate fruit juices in children with excessive weight gain. So the best um, uh, alternative is fresh fruits. And then we should also um, advise on avoiding skipping breakfast. And then the recommendation also is there for the traffic light diet. I think everybody uh, has probably heard of traffic light diet where they advise on the um, consumption of low calorie, moderate calorie and high calorie uh, diets. And then um, another concept is MyPlate, which has been introduced in the United States by the um, American Agriculture Department. 
and they uh, recommend a low in added sugar, low in concentrated fat, nutrient dense but not calorie dense within an appropriate calorie range and um, balanced protein and carbohydrate. So these are the recommendations for level of activity. So what is recommended is 60 minutes of daily moderate to vigorous exercise. And then um, it is also recommended to reduce the screen time. So no media should be allowed under the age of 18 months. And one hour limit of uh, is given for the ages of two to five years. And then the newest guidelines does not limit the amount of screen time for all the children. It used to be um, recommended as a screen time of two hours per day, but now the latest guidelines have said uh, the children, all the children can be allowed to use screen time uh, with parental monitoring. And they also advise, uh, actually recommend the use of screen-based physical activities such as extra games, where uh, it is video games with light to moderate intensity exercises with whole body movements. A very important area is um, the number of hours of sleep in children. The recommendation is appropriate amount of sleep for age. So according to the American Academy of Sleep Medicine, these are the number of hours which are recommended. Uh, so a child between 4 to 12 months of age should have at least 12 to 16 hours of sleep per day, while 1 to 2 years of age should have 11 to 14 hours, 3 to 5 years should have 20 to 13 hours, and 6 to 12 years should have at least 9 to 12 hours of sleep to have a healthy weight. And um, looking at the use of pharmacotherapy, um, it can be offered for older children above the age of 12 years with immediate and life-threatening comorbidities and severe obesity. And it may be offered for children between the age of 8 to 11 years as an adjunct to lifestyle changes and according to medication indication and risks and benefits. So let's look at some commonly used uh, medication, uh, metformin. Um, studies have shown modest and inconsistent effectiveness, and it may be used as an adjunct to intensive health behavior. Um, it is used when other indications are also present, such as PCOS and prediabetes. The dose is 500 milligrams once daily or BD. Maximum dose is 2,500 milligrams daily. And the adverse reactions are bloating, nausea, platelets, diarrhea, and rarely lactic acidosis in children. Another drug is Olistat. It blocks fat absorption through inhibition of gastric and pancreatic lipase. It is FDA approved for use in children above the age of 12 years. The dose is 120 mg TDS. Um, there are adverse reactions such as steatorrhea, platelets, and fecal urgency. So it is not well tolerated and thus not commonly used. Um, Glucagon-like peptide 1 receptor agonists, uh, these are some of the drugs at the uh, used in the market at the moment. Um, liraglutide is uh, FDA approved for age above 12 years and prescribed for obesity. And exenatide, an FDA approved for ages 10 to 17 years for type 2 diabetes. And then there are the two, dulaglutide and semaglutide. Um, they decrease hunger by slowing gastric emptying and by acting on targets in the central nervous system. It is usually given orally or as a subcut injection, and the adverse reactions are nausea, vomiting, risk of metalothyroid C, especially with liraglutide. And looking at some melanocotin 4 receptor agonists, um, it restores normal function for appetite regulation. Uh, given as a sub, the um, common drug is melanotide, given as a subcutaneous injection, 1 to 3 milligrams daily. It is FDA approved for the age above six years, especially for POMC deficiency, but uh, has um, adverse reactions such as nausea and injection site reactions. And fentanyl uh, reduce appetite by non-selective inhibition of serotonin and dopamine. It is FDA approved for short course therapy for ages of more than 16 years. Topiramate is frequently used in pediatrics but mostly for um, patients for, with epilepsy and as a prophylaxis for migraine. It's a carbonic anhydrase inhibitor. It suppresses appetite, and, but the mechanism is unknown. So FDA approval is for uh, children above 2 years for epilepsy and uh, children above 12 years for headache prevention. And adverse reactions are cognitive slowing and potential teratogenic. 
So metabolic and bariatric surgery has now become more and more uh, um, uh, important and frequent. Um, the analysis into weight loss procedures in the pediatric population was established only during the last 20 to 30 years, even though uh, metabolic and bariatric surgery has been there for the adults since about 1960s. So, but now with the studies, they have proven that it is safe and effective when performed in comprehensive metabolic and bariatric surgical settings that have experience in working with youth and families. So there are criteria for bariatric surgery. Um, the weight criteria is class 2 obesity, that is a BMI of 35 kilograms per square meter or more, or 120% of the 90th percentile for age with um, comorbidities shown on the left side of the, uh, sorry, right side of the slide. And then uh, class 3 obesity, which is BMI of more than uh, 40 kilograms per square meter or 140% of the 95th percentile for age and sex. But um, that itself is an indication for metabolic and bariatric surgery and does not require comorbid conditions to be present. So these are the procedures performed in the pediatric age group, um, laparoscopic ruin y gastric bypass and vertical sleeve gastrectomy. The benefits are it's, it causes a durable reduction in BMI and there's a significant improvement of comorbidities as well. Um, then there are also complications associated with these procedures. So 15% of the time there are minor complications, uh, mainly post-op nausea and dehydration. And 8% of the time uh, there may be major complications during the perioperative period. And um, subsequent uh, related procedures may also be required in 13 to 25% uh, of patients up to 5 years following the surgery. And a common finding is multiple micronutrient deficiency which requires routine and long-term monitoring. So just quickly look at the Sri Lankan guidelines. It was published in 2018 by uh, the Family Health Bureau. Um, it is on prevention of overweight and obesity among school children in Sri Lanka. Um, it was formulated by an uh, expert panel consisting of um, professors in pediatrics, professors of community medicine and nutritionists and endocrinologists as well. And they have done an immense work to come up with uh, guidelines um, in 2018. So this is what is uh, recommended for school children. Um, this indicates the portion sizes that uh, we should recommend. So half of the plate should contain starchy food, either rice or any starchy uh, vegetables like manioc, uh, even jackfruit. And then one third of the plate should be um, vegetables and green leafy vegetables. And the rest should be um, animal-based proteins or plant-based proteins. And this is the famous uh, food pyramid. I think most of you are familiar with this. And um, so these are the um, foods that have been uh, advised to if advised by the guidelines to um, avoid and should not be uh, sold in uh, school canteens. So sugar, uh, the foods with very high sugar, salt and fat like donuts, eclairs, biscuits, and other sweets, malted and chocolate drinks, and foods with taste enhancers such as monosodium glutamate and um, sodium uh, inosinate, uh, like such as uh, salted peanut pickles and pre-cooked instant noodles, then drinks like energy drinks and carbonated drinks, and foods with empty calories. Those are mainly sweets, uh, Bombay Motai, Bulto, Jujubes, chewing gum, lollipops, jelly cups, and the processed food like instant noodles, sausages, and meatballs. So these are prohibited to be sold in school canteens. So there's an interesting uh, and a very uh, colorful menu uh, given in the guideline. So these are the recommended healthy menus for snacks of school children. Um, so it basically contains the traditional breakfast that we are um, uh, you know, used to chickpeas, cowpea, tempered with onion and small pieces, 
of coconut egg hoppers um, then there is a recommendation for uh, um, whole grain bread sandwiches uh, kurakano whole wheat flour waffles um, then there's a, uh, it's recommended to uh, sell portion roti made with wheat coconut vegetables and green leaves with the cream and fish paste as spread and then most of these are actually what is commonly uh, consumed in our uh, you know, uh, society so yeah, I think it's very appropriate and uh, the interesting finding in this menu for me is that they have also added potato chips air fried without salt served with fish so it's a new development and then um, sweet meats the common uh, traditional sweet meats are loved along with beverages which are called a candle fresh fruit juice without sugar coconut water belly mal, ranavara and fresh milk with no sugar so this is the recommendation so these are my references and we have come to the end of the presentation thank you So uh, thank you, Amarasi, for that uh, wonderful lecture. Uh, the, does the audience have any questions uh, for the speaker? So. so the online audience also can uh, post questions while the chat.